Uh, <laughs> good morning, you guys. Um, it really is great to be here with you. We are in our current series where we are talking about how Jesus changes everything. And we've been doing that by traveling through the Gospel of Mark. Last week, Pastor Zach talked about the ways in which the kingdom is rooted in compassion, and his message took us through chapter 5. And today, we will be focusing on chapter 6, and our, our focus of the conversation is to be um, talking about how we are an important part of the kingdom story, and who we believe Jesus to be has a direct impact on what he can do through us. Now, Mark's telling of the good news is fast-paced, and I think that has been established throughout the past couple of weeks. Um, but at the same time, it is just packed full of awesome information about Jesus. And when you are reading through it, it's easy to kind of miss some of the things that Mark is talking about. He'll be on one subject, and then it seems like he abruptly switches to another subject, like he goes off on a tangent. But when we look more closely, we see that the seemingly off-placed side story is super important. And that happens a couple of times in the chapter that we will be looking at today, and it's pretty awesome. The thing is, is that Jesus was unexpected. The first century Jewish people were expecting and anticipating the coming of the Messiah. They were not, however, expecting Jesus. In fact, there really wasn't a category that Jesus fit into at all. The Jewish community of the time would have expected that their Messiah that they were looking for would have been surrounded by people of power and influence, someone that the religious leaders would have gotten behind and supported, and probably someone who would have spent time concerning himself with things like building a strong military. And then there was Jesus, a man who hung out in Galilee, a man who recruited fishermen instead of the religious leaders of Jerusalem, a man who prayed and healed and drove out demons. The first century Jewish people wanted a king who would come and defeat the Romans. But Jesus wanted to introduce them to the king of kings. The kingdom that Jesus spoke about did not make sense. It wasn't fueled by power, accessible by the wealthy. It was a kingdom fueled by faith. And the thing about faith is that anyone can have it. Outcasts, the sick and diseased, children, women, the powerless, the less than. Now, last week, Pastor Zach shared two stories of healing. And the first was the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. And the second was the healing or the raising of the dead. I would call that pretty radical healing of Jairus's 12-year-old daughter. Two separate inst instances interwoven together where Jesus shows great compassion. They are stories that demonstrate that Jesus' kingdom truly is for everyone. Jairus, a leader with financial means, and the woman who had spent all that she had trying to become well. One an outcast and the other well-known so there are two people from opposite ends of society with something pretty huge in common, their faith. These two stories about daughters, they level the playing field. They reveal what Jesus is looking for in those who follow him. The woman who had been bleeding risked everything just to touch Jesus' cloak. Maybe that came from years of living in the shadows, going unseen and untouched herself, that that small connection with Jesus, that, that was enough for her. And what this story does is it demonstrates that we can approach Jesus exactly as we are with, it, with whatever strength we have left, and he will do great things with it. And then there's Jairus who fights through the crowd, and he falls at Jesus' feet, begging him to come and see his little girl. And when they arrive, those paid mourners that Pastor Zach mentioned tell them that she had died. And Jesus responds, she's just asleep, and they begin to laugh. So Jesus does something pretty remarkable. He separates 
those who had left from Jairus and his wife, and he takes only the two of them with him to see the little girl. He removed those who did not have faith from those who did. And then he went about his business telling her to arise, and we know that she did just that. These stories reveal what happens when we have faith. Our faith moves Jesus into action. And these stories reveal what Jesus gives back. He gives himself. Then Mark transitions from these two amazing stories of faith to Jesus going back to his hometown of Nazareth. And that is where chapter 6 picks up. And we are going to read verses 1 through 6. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended, and they refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere, except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Why does Mark include this? Does he include this just to let us know that the people in Jesus' hometown kind of stunk? That even his own family didn't believe in who he was? And yes, that is super important to know. But why? The answer lies in the, in the verses um, that we just read. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. He was amazed at their lack of faith. So Mark moves us from two super powerful stories of healing, stories that are like a balloon filling with air and being given life and movement and purpose to this, a story much like a balloon popping and deflating and falling to the ground. Mark is talking about people who knew who Jesus was. They watched him grow up. They knew his brothers and sisters. He probably had done carpentry work for them. But what does it say? They were deeply offended, and they refused to believe in him. These people knew that Jesus was performing miracles, but they had a hard time believing that he was the one performing the miracles. He was unexpected. How could Jesus be the Messiah? He was Mary's son, one of them. And so Mark says that Jesus was limited in what he could do because of their lack of faith. And that sentence seems contradictory because Jesus, the son of God, can do anything. And it's true. But Mark makes a point to tell us that he was limited. He wants us to see the contrast in the stories of healing, the stories of faith of the woman and the little girl and what Jesus could do with their faith in comparison to what Jesus was met with in his hometown. He wants us to see that faith powers the kingdom, that it's not enough just knowing the person, Jesus of Nazareth, but knowing who Jesus of Nazareth was, the Messiah, the Son of God. Not just knowing that he can do things, but faith in who he is and the power that comes as the result of our faith. Because our relationship with him changes things. Our faith in the truth of who he was, who he is, impacts the kingdom. Because we are part of the kingdom story. And because Jesus represents a power that empowers and as we transition to verses 7 through 13, we're, we're going to find out that Jesus is doing just that. He is empowering his disciples. And he called his 12 disciples together, and he began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick, no food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals, but not to take a change of clothes. 
Wherever you go, he said, stay in the same house until you leave town. But if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So the disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. Now, there is so much awesome information in these verses, but we are just going to focus on the main points because in true Mark fashion, these verses, while vital, are setting the stage for what is to come. So what do we see? We see that the disciples were sent out two by two. This is giving the disciples mutual help and encouragement, but it also met the legal requirement for an authentic testimony. The second is that the disciples were to take nothing with them except a walking stick, which would have been a common companion of the time and something that also served as a source of protection from wild animals. They were not to bring food, a bag, or money. They could wear sandals, but they were not to bring extra clothes. So clearly the no bag thing made perfect sense if you are not bringing anything with you. The disciples were given very specific instructions, and the disciples were sent out exactly as they were. They were to take nothing that would flaunt wealth, like an extra outfit or like money. They were going out as the poor and hungry so that they were able to speak with the poor and hungry. They were made relatable, and they were utterly dependent on their faith in who Jesus was and what he could do through them. And because Jesus had given them his authority, wherever the disciples went, the kingdom of God was there too. Jesus tells them this, only stay where you are welcome, where you are invited. The kingdom will only stay where it is welcome, where it is invited. And if not welcome, shake the dust from that place off your feet. This would have meant something pretty big to the Jewish people because they literally shook the dust off of their feet when they returned from a pagan land. It was a formal judgment against a community, a sign of going from being unclean to clean again. So to shake the dust from a Jewish person's home from your feet, if they did not welcome you, if they did not welcome the kingdom, was a pretty powerful thing for Jesus to tell the disciples to do. So Jesus, a real king with real authority and power, is empowering his disciples to go out and do what he had been doing himself, bringing the good news of the kingdom of God to anyone who would invite them in. A king giving his power and his authority to other people so that even more people would be able to hear the good news. Now, this story actually concludes in verse 30, so quite a ways down in the chapter. But before we get there, there is another story just sandwiched in between, a super important story that talks about the tragic beheading of John the Baptist. However, it is a story that at closer look reflects a different kind of power from a different kind of king. And due to time, we're not going to read the verses entirely, but if you have your Bible, we are going to pick up in verse 14, and we're just going to give a synopsis of these verses. The story opens up with King Herod. And while Herod is referenced as king, he really didn't have the power that that name might allude to. Herod was actually a tetrarch, as he has inherited a quarter of his father's territory to rule over. So he did have power but he was absolutely under the authority of Rome, and he ruled through the lifespan of Jesus. Now, some words used to describe Herod are cunning, cruel, sensual, weak, and superstitious. So, you know, great qualities. In these verses, Mark shares some interesting facts. Herod married his brother's wife. Not because his brother died, but just because he wanted to. And her name was, I call her Herodias, but I'm sure it's more like Herodias. 
Um, but Herodias is what's, what you're going to hear today. <laughs> so you've got Herod, you have Herodias. No joke. Um, so this act would have caused great repercussions for a regular citizen. But because of the power that Herod had, it was overlooked. I mean, it was certainly frowned upon, but it was overlooked, and overlooked in the way like he got to live. And so did she. Now, John the Baptist is telling Herod that marrying his brother's wife really is not the right thing to do. So Herodias held a grudge against John for that reason. And she wanted to have him killed, but without the consent of her husband, she was powerless. Herod respected John because he believed he was a good and holy man. It says that he was disturbed by what John had to say, maybe convicted by what John had to say, yet he liked to listen to him. So Herod protected John the Baptist. Now Herod throws himself a lavish birthday party. And all of the important people, all of the important leaders of the time would have been there. And at this time period, they would have mostly all been men. And there is alcohol at this party, and Herod starts to show off. Now, as a gift for Herod, Herodias' daughter dances for the crowd. A girl dancing alone in this way was not super culturally acceptable. In fact, it was rather taboo. But the reality is, and as disturbing as it is, her dance pleases Herod and the guests so much that Herod offers her anything that she wants, up to half of his kingdom. Now, as a side note, this is clearly a super boastful and extravagant thing for Herod to say. He kind of got caught up in the moment, and I envision him standing up and just screaming, you can have half of my kingdom. He thought it would make him look super powerful, but it actually made him look rather foolish. So the girl runs to her mom, and she asks her, because she's not sure what she should ask for, what should I ask for? I can have anything, up to half of the kingdom. And so Herodias, or Herodias, senses her chance for power. And she responds, the head of John the Baptist, on a platter. So upon hearing this, Herod immediately regrets his grand gesture. But he has to save face. He cannot back down in front of his guests. So he honors the request. And the story plays out just as Herodias had asked. So here we move from Jesus sending the disciples out with super detailed instructions intent on making them relatable to those that they would encounter to this. And while the story accounts for the tragic death of John the Baptist, it goes more deeply than that. Because I can't think of a more contrasting account of power than King Jesus versus King Herod. One empowers and the other destroys. One sacrifices their life to include others while the other kills a life to elevate their own. One gives power to others while the other shows his power to others, hoping it will make him seem more powerful than he actually is. Power is an interesting thing. We all have it regardless of where we are at. And how we use it is a direct reflection of who we are following. In comparison to a king, we may not feel super powerful, but the reality is we are. Our gifts and our talents are powerful. Our resources, as grand or as small as they may be, are power. There's power in our relationships. If you're a daughter, a friend, a wife, a mother, a father, a husband, a coworker, there's power there. When we are accepted or rejected, there is power in our response. Jesus represented a very upside down view of power. I mean, if anyone could have come in completely full of himself, it was Jesus. But he came humbly into this world, and he left via a humiliating death. 
He came representing a power that said, the more you give away, the more you actually have. The more you build others up, the better off the kingdom actually is. The more you serve others, the more you consider others, the more you love others, that is power that changes the kingdom. And that is power that changes you. And the story of Herod causes us to pause and think. Our faith in who Jesus is is super important, but so is what we do with it, our power. Both have a direct impact on the kingdom, and how we use both has a direct impact on what God can do through us. And then in true Mark fashion, we, we read that immediately following the death of John the Baptist and his burial, the 12 disciples returned to Jesus and they share with him all that had happened on the time that they were gone. And Jesus tells them, we are going away. We are going to get some rest. And they board a boat on the Sea of Galilee, and they head to a desert place so that they can become refreshed. But as they are crossing the lake, they're recognized, and this crowd of people start running along the shoreline ahead of the boat. And they arrive before Jesus and the disciples. Now, I don't know how the disciples felt. They had just really returned from a mission trip of sorts and the burial of their friend. The Bible is clear that they did not get much rest or have much to eat. And as they come to shore, here is a crowd of people waiting. Now, I probably would have wanted to back that puppy right up and row on out of there. But Jesus, he was tired and weary too. But he knows how spiritually lost and hungry these people were for the truth. They ran along an entire lake to meet him. And so he has compassion on them, and he immediately begins to teach them. Now, as the disciples are watching this, they are becoming anxious because they can see that the day is winding down, and it is going to be dark soon, and they are getting concerned. And they're concerned because they were in a remote place, and food was not readily available. So they kind of encourage Jesus, who probably doesn't need their encouragement, but they encourage Jesus to send the people on their way so that they can go out and have time to get food to eat. But Jesus responds with, you feed them. Now, I don't know if you have ever been asked to do something that you really had no clue how you were supposed to do it, and you're sort of frozen in a state of, uh, come again? <laughs> um, but I think it's safe to say that the disciples were there, and Jesus is clearly aware of their confusion, and so he gives them an action step. He tells them, go and see what you can, can, you, what you can round up. And so they come back with what? We all know. Five loaves and two fish. So clearly not enough food to feed the thousands of people who are ready to eat. But Jesus takes the loaves and the fish, and he looks to heaven, and he blesses them. He blesses them so much, in fact, that there were 12 baskets left over after everyone's hunger was satisfied. So immediately after this happens, after everyone is fed, Jesus insists that his disciples get on the boat while he dismisses the crowd. And then he retreats to a hill to pray. Now I wonder if Jesus ever felt toward his disciples the way that we can feel maybe toward our kids or toward someone that we are trying to teach something to. You feel like you're speaking English or pretty clear English or Aramaic as the case would be here, but you're still met with that confused face. I mean, it really is no wonder why Jesus had to go on a hill and be alone. Now, Jesus, he stays on top of this hill through most of the night, but he has a very clear view of the disciples and what they are experiencing in their boat. They are struggling to get across the lake because the wind and the waves are so strong. So in the early morning hour, Jesus takes a shortcut to where the disciples are headed. And by shortcut, we mean he walked on the water, right by the disciples, in their distress. And the Bible says that he was going to walk right past them. But when the disciples see him, they're terrified. They think that he might be a ghost, so they cry out. 
And Jesus reassures them that it's just him, everything is okay, and he climbs in the boat. And as soon as he does that, the wind and the waves die down. Now, we just heard two crazy, amazing miracles, feeding 5,000 people and Jesus walking on the water. But there's something really important that we cannot miss. After Jesus climbs back in the boat, verses 51 through 52 tell us this. They were totally amazed, for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. So they were amazed that Jesus walked out to them on the water. They were amazed in the sense that it terrified them, but their hearts were too hard to take it in. How did that happen? I mean, here they had just witnessed a miraculous feeding of 5,000 people. But Mark makes it clear that their hearts were hard. There was something that they had missed. So what was happening is they're shutting down and they're closed off from what Jesus is trying to show them. And when you're shut down, maybe you know this from your own personal experience, you kind of become unaware of what's happening around you. You stop learning. You stop taking things in. So Jesus does something else. He walks out to them in their moment of desperation, and he reminds them just who he is. What the disciples missed isn't made super clear. Jesus did say some things during the time of feeding of the 5,000 that was difficult for them to hear, and we will get to that. But the feeding of the 5,000 bears many similarities to what we read in Exodus on how the Jewish people were fed during their 40 years in the desert. So for example, when Jesus and the disciples are on the boat heading for their time of rest, Mark makes it clear that they are going to a desert place. There are 12 baskets of food left over after everyone eats, just like there were 12 tribes of Israel in the desert. And in the Exodus story, God feeds the people with manna, food from heaven. And in the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus takes the food offered to him by the crowd and turns to heaven to multiply it to feed them with. I mean, that is pretty awesome. (laughs) I mean, certainly some people who heard what Jesus had to say thought that it was pretty cool, but other people, they did not. And what Jesus said to the crowd is, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And this proclamation turned several of his followers against him. I mean, how could he ask them to eat his body? That made no sense. They missed the point. And it was hard for the disciples, too, because how they thought things were going to play out appear like it's going to be a little bit different. And it was hard for them to take it in. And they became confused, and their hearts became hard. Now, could Jesus have produced enough bread to feed that crowd on his own? Absolutely. But what the story tells us is that Jesus is partnering with us. He is taking our food, and he is multiplying it to do what God had done with the manna. But this time, we are a part of the miracle. He says, you feed them, and they're like, "Uh, that's impossible. So he says, how much do we have to work with? You don't think that's enough? I will make it enough. But here's the deal. Your participation is required. Jesus can do amazing things, but we have to give him all that we have, even if it's just five loaves and two fish. He can work with whatever we give him, but we have to be willing to let it go. If you're sitting here today thinking that God doesn't need you, he needs you. God has made it so that he needs you. You, child of God, represent the kingdom exactly where you are at today. And he wants to partner with you with exactly whatever you have to offer 
And if we have learned anything today, it's that it is okay to come to Jesus just as you are. Whether you are broken and weary and just need to let your fingers touch his cloak, or if you are hungry to hear the truth in a world of confusion and misplaced power, or if you are terrified by the storms of life, come to him exactly as you are. Offer what you have back to him and watch him work. Because Jesus represents a power that empowers, and who you believe he is impacts what he can do through you. You are part of the kingdom story. Your participation matters. But the question is, what will you do with it? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much. We thank you um, just for the amazing things that you did in your time on this earth. We thank you that you are still approachable and relatable and that you want nothing more than to partner with us in the work that you are doing. Lord, we just commit the rest of this time to you. We thank you um, for your love for us. We thank you for all that you have given us. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen.